Hobbs liked to tell a story that his mother went into labour with him after hearing a rumour that the Spanish Armada was coming to England. Fear and I were born twins, Hobbes recounts, offering a metaphor for what could be the basis of his political philosophy. A fear of death and civil war drives his most famous text, Leviathan. Here he gives the first modern systematic account of why we should obey state authority. Both his methods and results were immediately controversial. He starts from a radical egalitarian basis, but ends in defending a theory of near-absolute monarchy. Readers today are horrified by the illiberal and seemingly totalitarian aspects of his politics. But his contemporaries were more worried about the potentially atheistic consequences of his materialist philosophy. We often hear that he was too pessimistic or too much of an individualist, but his thought is more subtle and sophisticated than is often acknowledged. In this video, we'll examine the historical background and philosophical basis for Hobbes' political thought. For a closer look at his text Leviathan, or for an analysis of other theories, check out my other videos. I'm James Muldoon, I'm a lecturer in political science at the University of Exeter, and this is an introduction to Hobbes. Hobbes' Life When Hobbes was born on 5th of April 1588, England was under existential threat from foreign powers and divided from within along religious and political lines. Hobbes was born into a relatively poor family, but was a gifted student and soon was able to speak Greek, Latin, Italian, French, and English. Later in life, he would often compose texts in both English and Latin alongside each other. He grew up and attended high school in the English town of Malmesbury, which was the basis for a later nickname, the Monster of Malmesbury. This wasn't because he was mean to all the kids in town, but because of his later infamous political writings. He studied humanist texts as a student, but was later given more of a scholastic education at the University of Oxford. He wasn't very keen on entering into a profession after he graduated. Thankfully, the very wealthy aristocratic family of Lord Cavendish, who later became Earl of Devonshire, employed him as a tutor for their son. He spent basically the rest of his life working for this family in some capacity. This seemed like a pretty sweet gig, because one of his responsibilities was taking the son William on a multiple year trip around Europe. But Hobbes wasn't just running elaborate gap year activities or drinking games with his student. He actually met a number of the leading politicians and philosophers of the day, including Galileo and René Descartes, or as some students like to call him, Descartes. Now, if meeting Descartes doesn't sound like your idea of a good holiday, Hobbes was different. He was fascinated by learning new advances that were happening in the sciences and philosophy. The Cavendish family were very involved in military affairs, and they were particularly interested in what was happening in contemporary advances in optics and ballistics, particularly as they related to military artillery. Through the trips that he took with the Cavendish family, Hobbes encountered a range of new ideas in the physical sciences that deeply impressed him. Hobbes' influences Hobbes grew up in a culture of modern humanism, and a philosophy dominated by Aristotelianism. His humanist background remained important to him throughout his life, but Hobbes would deeply challenge and transform this culture through his encounter with 17th century science. From Galileo, Hobbes took away the fundamental idea that the world was a law-governed system of matter in motion. He thought that you could understand physical reality as some kind of ballistic system of different bodies interacting with each other. Hobbes was also impressed by Descartes' rationalist method of philosophy and his attempt to meet the challenge of scepticism. But he disagreed with Descartes that things like our thoughts and feelings were essentially immaterial. Hobbes was a materialist who thought that all reality was matter in motion, and that even things like our thoughts ultimately had a material basis in our brains. One of Hobbes' main contributions to political philosophy was developing a materialist account of politics and human behaviour. He wanted to bring advances in the physical sciences to the study of politics and morality. If he could show that human beings could be understood through the mechanistic worldview of the physical sciences, then we could better understand how to govern them. At the age of 40, he is reported to have become very impressed with geometry after coming across a copy of Euclid's Elements. He liked geometry because following its methods, it appeared that you could obtain a certainty of results. In his political philosophy, he strived for a scientific method that could systematically prove arguments through deductive reasoning. He had plans of writing a unified science that would progress from physics to psychology and finally onto politics. Physics provided knowledge about physical reality, psychology provided knowledge about human beings, and politics would provide laws of how human society should be governed. 
You can see this method expressed in Leviathan, which starts with the study of an abstract human being, their psychology, their motives, their drives, and then only progresses in Book 2 onto an account of politics. Hobbes's philosophy results from his early humanist influences that have been radically changed and transformed through his encounter with the 17th century physical sciences. War and Politics In the early 17th century there were wars right across Europe. The wars of religion after the Reformation had been fought right across the continent and nearly every territory now had to live with a significant degree of ideological conflict. England was engaged in a war against Spain which soon spread across Europe as well. Eventually, the entire continent was caught up in what would later be known as the Thirty Years' War, which only ended with the Treaty of Westphalia. When the English Civil War broke out, Hobbes was worried about the way some of the things he had written would be interpreted, and so he, along with other royalists, fled to Paris. During his time in Paris, he was cut off from his main source of income with the Cavendish family. So he accepted a post as a mathematics tutor for the Prince of Wales, who would later become the monarch Charles II. Charles described Hobbes as the oddest fellow he ever met, which is a pretty big claim because I imagine there would be some very weird characters in the European aristocracy. It would be wrong to see the English Civil War as the basis for Hobbes' text Leviathan because we know from two earlier texts that a lot of his system was already worked out before the start of the war. But the Civil War and discussions that he was having with other exiles in Paris formed the basis for him to start thinking about politics again and to expand on his ideas. The wars of Hobbes's era tended to be over religious and ideological disagreements. They were defined primarily not as struggles over land or resources, but as disagreements over how to interpret the meaning of texts. This is really important for his political philosophy because Hobbes' sovereign is someone who settles meaning over disputes and makes authoritative interpretations about politics. It's like the person who looks something up on Google in order to settle an argument you're having over drinks. With all the arguments that were happening in Europe over how to interpret the Bible and how to organise religion and politics, Hobbes wanted to construct an argument for legitimate authority that didn't need to rely on any kind of ideas about God's will. His text is a step away from any kind of divine rights theory of monarchs being appointed by God, and towards a much more pragmatic approach. Hobbes thought that it was enough that we should try and avoid civil war, and that we should try and develop a society in which art, sciences, and many other activities can flourish. When Hobbes published Leviathan, his royalist friends were absolutely livid. They thought that it bordered on atheism and that it undermined the role of religion in society. In a final review and conclusion of the book, Hobbes also seemed to suggest that people should submit to the new parliamentary regime which had deposed the king. His support for the new regime was based on his principle that a sovereign could only command authority if it could guarantee security. He didn't think you could have a legitimate claim to rule unless you had the power to enforce the law. But this apparent support for the new regime became a source of tension after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. He lived to the age of 91, and despite a couple of scares, was never imprisoned or killed by the new regime. But it was a great irony that after advocating for a sovereign with near absolute power over its subjects, that Hobbes would live his last years of life in constant fear on account of his political views. The social contract tradition. Hobbes begins a natural law tradition in political philosophy, which uses the conceptual device of a hypothetical state of nature and a social contract as the basis of an argument. One of the reasons Hobbes is so influential is that even writers who disagree with him use this underlying framework in order to make their own claims. The social contract is a narrative about the origin and foundation of political society that tries to show why state authority should be considered as legitimate. It's an attempt to justify the existence of the state and to show why we should all obey the law. This way of talking about politics becomes ubiquitous in the 17th and 18th centuries and starts to be employed by Locke, Spinoza, Rousseau, and Kant. Even a 20th century thinker like John Rawls will draw on the social contract tradition in his book A Theory of Justice. The social contract tradition tries to imagine what life would be like before any kind of political society and tries to see this as what they call a state of nature. This so-called natural condition of human beings is usually imagined as a dangerous or at the very least uncertain state where people lack basic security and safety. Think of all those post-apocalyptic movies where people are left to basically fend themselves without any kind of government or police. 
It's also a way of imagining what people might be like outside of society or before the influence of any kind of customs or morality. People in a state of nature are basically free and equal because they can do what they want and there's no kind of law or private property, at least for Hobbes. But there's also no security, there's no certainty and there's no chance to develop art, sciences or any other kind of activity. So as a result of this constant uncertainty, people choose to come together to create a contract and construct a new political society. For Hobbes, it's only because of this hypothetical social contract that people can be said to have legitimately consented to society. Hobbes starts this whole tradition, but every later theorist begins to put their own twist on what a state of nature and political society would be like. Hobbes, for example, thinks that a state of nature would be a condition of war, whereas Locke and Rousseau have some doubts about this. He also says that the social contract is going to be between all the individuals who are living in a state of nature, and this contract is going to create a sovereign figure as an artificial person. But Locke will say that once people are in civil society, they're actually going to make a separate contract with the sovereign themselves, who's going to be bound by the conditions. Finally, Hobbes thinks that the power that a sovereign gets under a social contract is nearly absolute, whereas a lot of later writers are going to think that it comes with a variety of limitations based on natural law. Hobbes is widely regarded as one of the most important thinkers of modern politics and a forerunner to modern political science. Some of his most important lessons for politics are contained in his 1651 text Leviathan. If you're taking my class on modern political theory, then you're kind of obliged to watch the next video on Leviathan, but otherwise, follow the links and subscribe for more political philosophy.